All right, once again, it's time for your questions, my answers. You've been asking a lot of questions in the last couple of weeks, which is great. I've been jumping in there, I've been answering questions, and I've pulled out a bunch of my favorites. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of our nearly 700 patrons who are supporting this show. Uh, you cover the costs of the, of the camera work, of the editing, of Chad's time. Uh, it, it blows me away that you guys are supporting this. So thank you so much. And if you want to join, go to patreon.com slash universe today. All right, well, let's get into the questions. Now, Torture asks, why can't we use antimatter as a source of fuel? We totally can use antimatter as a source of fuel. It's the most, really, it's the most efficient possible fuel that we could use. But the trick is that antimatter is not really fuel, but it's more like a battery because you have to make antimatter. It doesn't just exist. You can't just go and mine it out of the ground. You have to use like a particle accelerator to, to split up matter and antimatter. You've got you've to hold the antimatter in some kind of magnetic bubble. And then when you want to use it, then you take your antimatter and you combine it with matter and you get a pure energy conversion. So it's incredibly energy efficient, incredibly energy dense. It's just incredibly dangerous to carry around and very expensive to make. So right now, it's beyond really our capability to make any significant amount of antimatter. But once we get a better technology, we can totally use it as a fuel. Maz Oler. Could an asteroid cause a super volcano like Yellowstone to erupt by crashing into it? I don't know if, if the asteroid like directly struck the Yellowstone that it would cause it to erupt. Uh, but it just depends on the size of the asteroid and depends on the speed that it's going. But, but we know that if a large enough asteroid hits the Earth, like say when the moon was formed, something Mars-sized hit the Earth and turned the entire planet molten. So we know that's possible. Another really intriguing idea is that when an asteroid strikes the Earth, it causes ripples through the planet, which come around to the backside of the planet, the antipode of where that impact, impact happened, and causes like a disturbed terrain. It could cause volcanism on the exact opposite part of the Earth, where the waves moving through the rock pile up and, and cause volcanism. So it's a really interesting concept. So really, it just depends on how hard you hit it and with how big of an object. Bike Jake. If an asteroid on the ISS threw a handheld object like a wrench or a bag of poo directly towards the Earth, is that enough velocity to guarantee re-entry? The first thing to keep in mind is that the International Space Station is constantly falling and it has to reboost itself every couple of months to gain altitude above the Earth's atmosphere. The atmospheric drag is constantly pulling it on it. Now the space station has a really big surface area, and so it drags against the atmosphere quite a bit. If an astronaut threw a wrench or poo directly towards the Earth, they would impart a velocity on it that would send it on a trajectory that would get it closer and closer to the atmosphere. Just being outside in space at that altitude, it's going to have drag. It's going to re-enter the atmosphere anyway. So all you're really going to do is speed up a little bit how fast it's moving down towards the Earth. So it wouldn't make that much of a difference. It would help a little bit, but really anything at that altitude is doomed anyway just by the atmosphere. Rohan Shah. Fraser, can one black hole suck in another black hole? Absolutely. Well, you wouldn't call it sucking in another black hole. What will happen is that the black holes will merge. So you take the mass of the one black hole, you take the mass of the other black hole, and the two come together, their event horizons cross, and then inside the singularities, now we got ravens. There you go. Last week, <laughs> there's ravens right above us. Okay. And whatever happens at the singularities inside this event horizon, the, the, they'll merge together and you'll now have a, a black hole that is the addition of the two masses of the other two black holes. And this can happen again and again. And now with the recent discovery of gravitational waves, we saw these, we saw these black holes merge together for the first time. 
by detecting the gravitational waves that were pushed out into the universe as two black holes came together. And over the next couple of years, the, the, the instruments are gonna get more sensitive and there's gonna be more technology and maybe even space-based missions and we're gonna get better and better at detecting these, these sort of mergers of, of black holes. So it's a pretty exciting time for this. FIFO fast. Hey Fraser, any chance you could start answering serious questions and stop feeding the trolls? Are you trolling me right there? That's very meta. Uh, I occasionally answer hate comments and troll comments. And the reason I do that is not because I think I can convince them. They're, they're gone. They're beyond hope. They, they all deserve a banning. They get banned or silenced. They're gone. But I really think that for the people who are on the sidelines, who who aren't in it as much as we are and are they're the people who have the nonsense pseudoscience beliefs are also really trying to market their ideas everywhere they can. They go on to discussion forums and they blast it at Twitter and they send a lot of angry comments. And I think that it's our job as people who, who are trying to communicate proper science to calmly and not troll feedingly uh, answer them. And sometimes, when we feel like it, when we think there's a good opportunity, not for them. They're, like I said, they are, they are beyond hope. But for the other people from the sidelines who are watching, who they watch one crazy person, the troll, having a reasoned, reasonable conversation with a person like me. Now, at the same time, you definitely need to be really careful and you definitely don't need to like directly feed the trolls. But I do think there's a lot of value in in having the occasional conversation with people who believe really nutty things. So that's, that's why I do it, and I, it's kind of fun. Chris Clark, are the galaxy names Andromeda, Cigar, Pinwheel, Milky Way, etc., officially adopted, or are they just colloquial names that just kind of stuck? Uh, it's kind of both. So it really depends on, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of catalogs of different objects of galaxies and other objects in space. And any one galaxy can be in multiple catalogs and have different designations. So, for example, um, there's the Messier catalog, which is 110 objects, some are galaxies, so Andromeda is M31, so its name is Andromeda, but also its, its, its designation in the Messier catalog is M31, and then there's the NGC catalog, and then there's a whole bunch of other catalogs, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey catalog and, and more. And some of these terms are, you know, is a colloquial name that's used by astronomers, and others are terms that are, that are pulled from the designation, like the big long numbers for pulsars. When an astronomer used one of these colloquial names in their research paper, everyone knows what they're talking about. So it's, it's not like the official designations of objects from the International Astronomical Union, right? Like the names of, of asteroids or comets or things like that. A lot of these objects are familiar, they've been known for a long time, and that's the name that they've got. And any new object, there's so many galaxies being discovered now, they just can't name them all. And, I don't think there will ever be any process that will give them any official designation. They just all have a designation in a various catalog that is recognized by the International Astronomical Union. So it's kind of both. Curry the Vegan. How do we know the gravitational waves we detected were caused by two black holes merging? The LIGO instrument which detected the black hole merger was really calibrated to find the most energetic and powerful gravitational wave events that are possible. And the only thing that we know about are merging black holes. I mean, maybe you could have a supernova that ejects a companion star away, but really nothing gets the gravitational waves going more than two, you know, 20 mass black holes crashing into each other. So that's, it had to be for the scale of the gravitational waves. And it's crazy, right, that, that they were so faint, we could just barely detect the most gravitationally energetic events in the universe that we can find. Hopefully, in the future, we'll, they'll get more sensitive and find other classes of events. But right now, it's just the biggest ones that are possible. Ali Armour 107. 
Is there such a thing as a type infinity civilization if the universe is actually infinite? Right, so you're riffing off last question shows type four civilization. And the problem is, is that at a certain point for any civilization, the, the galaxies are going to be spreading away from, from them essentially faster than the speed of light. So wherever you are in the universe, even though there is more universe out there and potentially an infinite amount of universe, we'll never be able to reach it unless we can figure out a way to go faster than the speed of light. If we can figure out how to go faster than the speed of light with wormholes or, or whatever, then the laws of physics as we understand them just don't matter anymore and you've got all new laws of physics and that'll define new limits and maybe define an entirely new way that you can have a civilization. But for now, there is a region of space that can be reached and outside of that, we can never reach it. 96 Ben West. Hey Fraser, what kind of discoveries would be possible if we had another point of view? Assuming communication would be instant on the other side of the Milky Way. If we were located on the other side of the Milky Way, what would we see? We would see kind of the same thing, except it would be, we would see stars and we would see planetary nebula and we would see star clusters and, and all the kinds of things that we see on our side of the Milky Way. If we were closer into the core, we might see a more density. If we were further out, then we would see less stars in the sky. But essentially it would be the same kind of stuff. Now the one big advantage is that we'd be able to see what the great attractor is. And this is this mass that is located directly in between us, uh, directly on the other side of the core of the Milky Way, the disk of the Milky Way. So it's mostly obscured from our point of view. If we were on the other side of the Milky Way, we would be able to just look at it. There'd be no question what it is, although it's you know, probably a big galaxy cluster that is causing us to gravitationally move towards it. But apart, apart from that, it, it would be essentially the same thing. Dante Frost, here's an idea. If the Earth keeps reshaping its surface because of the tectonic plate movement, where one slowly slides under the other, everything on the surface of the Earth now will eventually be destroyed by this tectonic plate recycle process. What are the chances that civilizations existed on Earth before, but the traces got wiped out by this process? Is Earth old enough for this to happen? Yeah, you're exactly right. Big chunks of the Earth's surface are being resurfaced by plate tectonics. In some cases, a piece of Earth can appear, say, at one part, like Hawaii, and then it gets pushed over, and then it subducts under another plate, and it's gone. And any, any civilization that was on, you know, on there, and any life that was there, any evidence of fossils, gone back into the Earth. But there are chunks of the Earth that have been around for, for a very long time and haven't gone back under. Uh, places in Quebec, uh, places in Australia that are billions and billions and billions of years old and they almost as old as the Earth itself. And we haven't seen any evidence of any civilization on them. It's, you would more think that any evidence of civilization would just be weathered away over the course of millions, hundreds of millions, and billions of years. There's not a lot that could withstand the weathering of a billion years, even if it was made out of marble and, and with really high technology. A billion years is a long time to be rained on and wind and other forms of you know, glaciation. So I don't think it could last, uh, even if it, it was, had never subducted. J. Francis, do any stars have a solid core? Stars, like our sun, are made of hydrogen and helium. Now, that sounds like gas, like a very light, fluffy hydrogen, right? But, but the point is that in a star, the gravity is pulling the mass of the star together with such strength that down in the core, the hydrogen is denser, is 150 times denser than water. Like that's denser than rock, that's denser than lead. That is dense. So I don't think you can call that a light fluffy gas. That is super rock, right? But it's made of hydrogen. It's that, that our concept of what a star is is, is you know, our understanding of gas and atmosphere and stuff is only here on Earth where there's not a ton of it 
piling down on top of us. But once you get that much compressed into one area, then, then what is a solid core? That sounds like a solid core to me. It's not made of dirt, but it is definitely very dense and uh, you know, a lot more dense than, than anything around us right now. Arjun Patel, how large can a main sequence star get before the gravity is stronger than the fusion pressure? A star like our sun, main sequence star, has a core of hydrogen that is being fused into helium. That process releases gamma radiation, which pushes outward, and that light pressure goes against the gravity that's pulling inward, and the star is a sphere. If the star is much larger, more massive than our own sun, say 10 times more massive, 20 times more massive, then the still same process still happens inside of it. It's just that <clears throat> when the hydrogen fuel gets used up, then it can move to heavier and heavier elements. So it can turn helium into, I forget, like oxygen, and it can go up to silicon. Now, when it gets up to iron, iron requires, doesn't produce energy from fusion. And so this whole process that is keeping the star a sphere that's stopping the gravity from collapsing it inward, that, that source of photons shuts off. And it shuts off instantaneously. Like within a moment, when the iron, when, the, when it moves up to iron in the core of the star, there's no more light pressure. And the entire star just collapses down inward. And from, so really, there's no size of star where you don't get that process. You're going to get a star that's going to start with hydrogen, move up the table of elements, get to iron. When the iron happens, the, the fusion energy shuts off, and the whole thing just pancakes down together. It's possible that even high, much, much larger stars, say 150 times the mass of the sun, when the star starts to form, it starts putting out such powerful winds that it blows away material that's trying to fall in. So it can never really get that much larger. But astronomers think that in the earliest ages of the universe, it's possible there were stars that were much larger, like maybe 500 times the, sun, the mass of the sun or thousands of times the mass of the sun. They still really don't know what the limits were in the early universe. But for all main sequence stars, from the smallest red dwarfs to the largest giant stars, they have the same process. All right, well, that's it, another week, another question. So again, wherever you're going, just type in your question on the YouTube channel. I'll find them, I'll answer them, and we'll do this again.